back in our Father's Word, book of Luke, the light giver. Christ has just been betrayed by Judas with a kiss, uh, an act showing love, but betrayal written all over it. Um, that's th that, that is life, and so it is that uh, it was written long ago that it would happen exactly that way. So we pick it up, if we would, in chapter 22, verse uh, 48, uh, as the betrayal continues, uh, Christ being delivered up in the night hours. And verse 48 reads, But Jesus, um, after Judas had kissed him, but Jesus, Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Here, this show of um, love and brotherhood, but at the same time, treachery. Verse 49, when they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? Now they did carry arms, and they were good with them. Verse 50, and one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And of course, this was Peter, and the, um, as it is written in John chapter 18, verse 10, this servant's name was Malchus, which means king or kingdom. And old Peter, you know, it takes a pretty good swordsman, instead of cracking the skull wide open, to simply slice off an ear as warning. But that's not how it was meant to be, so what follows? Verse 51, And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. In other words, cease, cease. And he touched his ear and healed him had that capability. Verse 52, and then Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him, be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves? You see, this is a little old ragtag temple guard. It's not the Roman troops. It's not a professional group of soldiers. They probably got pitchforks, sticks, stones. They're, they're out doing the chief priest bidding. And of course, this is not a chief priest appointed by God, but appointed by a Roman um, leader over to be in that area. They didn't pick them too good, as we find out. Verse 53, when Jesus continues speaking, when I was daily with you in the temple. You stretch forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. And he speaks to Satan directly. The prince of darkness, it's your hour. In other words, Christ was betrayed, and uh, here we go. But always remember, Christ did give us power over all of our enemies, including this prince of darkness, which is none other than Satan. All you have to do is declare it in Christ's name, <clears throat> and they must obey you. But here we have this one that taught in the temple openly. He didn't hide. <clears throat> Why wouldn't they take him there? They didn't take him there because the people would have risen, they would have risen up and co even come against the chief priest and the guards. Well, they, they loved the Lord. And, and many of them believed. But here you have this power of darkness, and that darkness is something that truth, which is light, will always overcome. That is why the sword of the Lord is truth. And truth cuts a wide swath in declaring it and demanding it, for it strengthens hearts. It raises people up to withstand the uh, times that we live in, even the times of darkness, that Prince of Light, which is to say the Lord Jesus Christ, gives us that ability to surmount and to overcome with light, because just a small candle will chase all the darkness from a room. Just a small truth from God's Word will overshadow Satan and his henchmen. Verse 54, 
Then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house. And Peter followed afar off. He didn't get too close, but he was there keeping his eye on the Lord. You want to remember what the Lord had already told him, that he would deny him thrice before the cock would crow that morning. 55. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. Now what they're doing here is illegal. They're really having a trial even before daylight, good daylight. That's against the law. Could, do you think they cared? Of course not. 56. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, this man was also with him. What did Peter do? 57, and he denied him, saying, woman, I know him not. That's once. I know this had to break Peter's heart later. And I, uh, Peter, having just cut the ear off of one of the chief priest's uh, servants, he was not a coward. But I really believe this happened as a warning to us today, that when you're delivered up before the false Christ, don't you deny the Lord Jesus Christ, don't you deny the Holy Spirit the opportunity to speak through you as it is written in Mark 13, Matthew 24, and even Luke 21. Don't you dare deny him. You see the grief that Peter went through because of this, and of course the Lord told him, when you recover yourself, strengthen the troops, lead them. Verse 58, after a little while another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And you got to remember, he's a Galilean and he's dressed as a Galilean. And here he's in the midst of these people and naturally it shows up, 59. And about the space of one hour, you can consider that to be the hour of temptation if you wish. Don't let the hour of temptation take you in in these end times. After another confidently affirmed, saying, of a truth this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. I can tell by his dress. What did Peter do? Verse 60, here comes the third time. And Peter said, man, I know not what thou sayest, three times, and immediately, while he yet spake, the cock crew. I want you to be strengthened from the fact that this was all prearranged, and it came to pass exactly as Christ said it would, right to the instant, as a warning to you, as a watchman, don't do as these did earlier in, in Gethsemane, at the oil press, go to sleep. You're a watchman, you're supposed to watch. And don't let that happen to you in these end times especially. As you see prophecy come to pass before your very eyes, then stay alert. But Christ is still on the throne. Everything is going down as it's written, even to the moment as it stipulates here. Though it is a great embarrassment to Peter let it be assurance to you that our Father does love His children. He knows sometimes we fall short, but at the same time, He gives us examples of how not to fall short and to serve Him. That's what you want to do. Be a watchman in these end times. Verse 61, and, and listen what happens then. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Oh, how ashamed he must have been. Lord, looking right upon him with understanding eyes, I have no doubt. But at the same time, letting him know. 62, and Peter went out and he wept bitterly. Naturally, he would. He was a gallant, brave soul that old fisherman was, and he was not afraid to bring forth the Word of God. 
And I think he was used, uh, Satan was happy about this, but he won't be happy long because Christ has come to this earth to, as it is written in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, to be crucified, whereby within that he may destroy death, which is to say the devil. No, he won't be happy long. Verse 63, And the men that helped Jesus mocked him, and smote him. 64, And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smote thee? Oh, I'll tell you one thing. He knew who they were. And during the millennium, what, what a fantastic duty it would be to, to uh, correct this uh, insult. Big time. Uh, how precious it would be, but how I would hate to be in their shoes, mocking the Lord Jesus Christ in that way, the very Son of God, the Word become flesh walking among us and going through this humiliation, but He did it for you so that you, your sins can be forgiven, washed away with the blood of the Lamb, and from his body, that bread, he took the stripes. You get the healing. He did that for you. Verse 65, And many other things blasphemously spake they against him. And, and um, you know what? You want to take it as an example. They're going to do the same thing to you when you're delivering up before the false messiah. You will be ridiculed for not accepting the false Christ as the true thing because they're deceived. And they will be down upon you pretty good. That's fine. They're the ones that are misled. They're the ones that, are, that have been deceived. You stay the course and stay true for truth sets you free. Verse 66, And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together and led him into their council, saying, 67, this also is a little bit illegal this, this time of day. Art thou the Christ? Question. Tell us. Note how Christ answers. And he said unto them, If I tell you, you will not believe. Now notice he didn't say he was the Christ. He said, If I tell you, you're not going to believe anyway. Verse 68, And if I also ask you, you will not answer me, nor let me go. You're not about to let me go. <clears throat> Verse 69, Hereafter, shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. And of course, what he's quoting there is Psalms 110, which we covered you, for you not long ago, where it would say that he would sit down at the right hand of God until his enemies were made his footstool. These are his enemies, and they're going to be made his footstool. That's why he's bringing forth this scripture at this time for your benefit. Did they recall Psalms 110? Hardly. Verse 70, listen. They, then said they all, Art thou then the Son of God? Question. And he said unto them, You say that I am. Notice how he answered that. You're the ones that are saying that I am. See, he didn't say it. But watch what they do. 71, and they said, What need we any further witness? For we ourselves have heard of his own mouth. Heard what? They didn't hear anything from his own mouth. You see, people hear what they want to hear, especially if it's, uh, if it's, if accusations are being made and many times um, these accusations are so far from the truth, and, and so it was. But uh, here, here we are 
with Christ being delivered up to the, a little ragtag army that the disciples, had they wanted to, could have, uh, could have overcome the whole bunch. When Peter sliced that ear, if the others had drawn, and the whole bunch would have ran like rabbits. <clears throat> it wasn't meant to be. God's word always comes to pass as it is written. Christ is delivered up. Here we go, chapter 23, verse 1. And the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. You see, they did not have the right to sentence anyone to death. They had to go through the Roman government. And Pilate, of course, being the one, um, the governor in that particular area at that particular time. And Pilate then, I, I want you to note in another book in John, Pilate's wife would tell him from the night before, I had a vision from God, this man is innocent. So Pilate knew that this was religion they were talking about. It certainly had nothing to do against Caesar or Rome. Verse two, <clears throat> excuse me. And they began to accuse him saying, we found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar saying that he himself is Christ a king. So here you have three charges being made here. Three charges. One is attempted sedition. And the second is, is um, refusal to pay tribute to Caesar. And third is um, rival claim to kingship. We've got three very, very serious charges. None of them are true. Caesar certainly isn't. Uh, what did Christ say when he was given the coin? What did he say? Whose inscription is upon this coin? Well, Caesar's. Well, then give Caesar that that is Caesar's and God that that is God's. So you see, it's a lie that they have trumped up. <clears throat> Verse 3, And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it. And again, pay attention to what he said. Did he say, I am? No, he did not. He said, You're the one that said that. Verse 4, And then said Pilate to the chief priest and to the people, I find no fault in this man. Now, this goes against everything they're wanting. They're wanting him put out of commission. I mean, after all, he went into their church, platted a cat of nine tails. I mean, he laid it to the back of the money changers and those that sold those mite-infested doves for a little something for God. And he cleaned house, their house. They're, they're, they are not, and he is pulling people away from their congregations. They're not happy with him at all. Verse 5, and they were the more furious, saying, He stirreth up the people teaching throughout all Jewry. That's a made up word, it means Judea. Beginning from Galilee to this place, all the way from where he was born, right up to this place, he has spread trouble and all this uh, surrection uh, from Galilee all the way to here. Everywhere he goes, he's trouble, trouble, trouble. They're upset, needless to say. Verse 6, when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. Verse 7, and as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. Just as happenstance would have it, hey, I can just pass the buck right here and slide this right on over into Herod's court because he is over Judea, uh, Galilee. And Herod, of course, he loved John the Baptist. And through um, sexual favors to his stepdaughter, he had to have John the Baptist beheaded. And but he's heard stories of the miracles that Christ has worked. 
And he's wanted, he's been, he has wanted to meet Christ. Herod has. And um, so it follows. Verse 8, And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. He, he was um, fascinated by the Word of God, even though he was a sinner indeed, and, and though he um, broke many of God's laws. Verse 9, And then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. In other words, he, it comes to pass, and it is the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7, where it says, as a lamb is delivered up to the shears, he doesn't open his mouth, doesn't defend himself one iota. It's prophecy. The fact that he doesn't answer or defend himself. Why? He was doing this for us. He was doing it for you, that you could have the forgiveness of sins, that um, you could have the freedom of being cleansed on repentance, and he himself paying this awesome price. Uh, and so it was. He just answered nothing. Next verse, please. We go with verse 10. And the chief priest and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Oh, they were on a rip snorter. They really were. Verse 11. And Herod, with his men of war, set him at naught, and mocked him, and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him again to Pilate. I, I think what they're doing, they're hoping and mocking him and scourging him, that they'll, somebody will feel a little sorry for him when they see the blood of the thorns coming down his forehead that they'll say, enough, let's let him go. No, no way. They had no compassion whatsoever. None. Verse 12. And the same day, Pilate and Herod were made friends together. For before they were at enmity between themselves, they, they were not friends. <clears throat> Verse 13. And Pilate... When he had called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, 14, he said unto them, You have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people. And behold, I, having examined him before you, I have questioned him, I have investigated this case, have found no fault in this man touching those things whereof you accuse him. I don't find him guilty of not one of those three charges that you trumped up. Of course, he didn't tell them they had trumped him up, but he knew they had. He knew they were false. Why? He had investigated. And do you know something? You could investigate Christ here and from birth and even in prophecy before birth and throughout the Word of God. And you will never find anything to accuse him of that is vile or against God's Word. You would never find anything. He was the perfect sacrifice without blemish, without spot. So rightfully, Pilate was saying the truth. He was innocent. Verse 15 to continue. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him. And lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. Herod can't find a thing wrong that would require death. It's just it's impossible. It's not there. Verse 16, I will therefore chastise him and release him. In other words, hoping, no doubt, 
that in seeing him punished, they would feel sorry for him and soften and let him go. But not this group. Again, as I stated earlier, there's no compassion here. Nothing is going to cause them. And as was customary at this time, it was customary for Pilate to release one prisoner to the people. And it so happens there is a man there that's guilty basically of all of the three charges that uh, Christ has been charged with. His name was Barabbas. And Barabbas means son of the father. The same as Yeshua, Messiah, is son of God, son of the father also. But two separate fathers. One indeed is a child of the devil, so to speak and the other the Son of God. And it was customary that Pilate should release one. So he's going to offer them Christ instead of Barabbas. Okay, give them the choice. Let's go with the next verse, verse 17. For of necessity he must release one unto them at the feast. In other words, when Passover came, he had to release one. Verse 18, and they cried out all at once, I mean in secession, saying, Away with this man and release unto us Barabbas. And, uh, and there you have it. The old, I mean the, one of the greatest sinners in the whole country at that time. They wanted him released, but not the Lord Jesus Christ. And what they will cry in a moment is what they truly wanted. Verse 19, who for a certain sedition made in the city and for murder was cast into prison. He was a bad dude. <clears throat> 20, therefore, a pilot, therefore, willing to re release Jesus, that's who he wanted to turn loose, spoke again to them. 21, but they cried saying, crucify him, crucify him. They want blood. And there, there's no out other than for Pilate. Pilate in another place about this time would wash, call for water and wash his hands. And he would say, I wash my hands of, of the blood of this man. He knew he was innocent. Why? He had investigated. He wasn't playing guessing games. He had done, Christ had done nothing deserving of this. You let a few Kenites in the group and let one of them yell crucify and work up the mob with lies and deceit. And you see our people, how easily they can be um, misled. Verse 22, and he said unto them a third time, he's trying, why, what evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him, I will therefore chastise him and let him go. Pilate is really trying here. And he says, I can't, I, I don't find not one reason. And again, as I forestated, you can investigate the life of Christ inside and out and you'll never find anything that would uh, uh, cause him a small sin, much less uh, a cause for death. 23, and they were instant with loud voices. You got a mob requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. They did not give up. The old chief priest right in the midst with them. That's why he is so adequately named in Psalms 22, long before the fact. 24, and Pilate he gave sentence that it should be as they required. He gave in to it. He was responsible for peace in Jerusalem. And it was obvious this thing was getting out of hand. 25, and he released unto them him that for sedition and murder was cast into prison 
whom they had desired, but he delivered Jesus to their will. He gave him over to them. And here we have that one that was perfect, about to pay that price. And it is Passover, and we have the Passover lamb. 26, and as they led him away, they laid hold, they laid hold on one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And there he carried that cross um, up to Golgotha, to Calvary. 27, there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. They were crying as they went up that path to Golgotha. 28, but Jesus turning unto them said, daughters of Jerusalem, you listen closely now, daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming, and they are, in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bear, and the paps that never gave suck. In other words, blessed are those that remain spiritual virgins until the true Christ returns. Verse 30, then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. When they realize they've been deceived, he's talking about the deception of the false Christ. Verse 31, And if they do these things in a green tree, if they do this while blood still circulates in my veins, what shall be done in the dry? When I come back as the Holy Spirit, and at that time, when this weeping uh, transpires, then how will it be? And he hints toward the unpardonable sin. We'll pick this up in the next lecture. We get you right to miss it. it. We got Victoria from Mississippi. Uh, let's see. For, I have a question about Second Peter chapter three verse ten. I believe when you say that only the elements of evil rudiments will be burned up, but don't, I don't understand when the verse says, after the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also uh, and the world. That is to say, this age will pass at that time. What, what I want you to do, so that people have trouble understanding Station, the elements. Make a note, Galatians chapter 4, I'm going to say it again, Galatians chapter 4, read verse 3, and then read verse 9, the beggarly elements are what are destroyed, not those that God loves, they are free, they are safe, he will never touch them, Galatians chapter 4, verse 3 and 9, read them. Uh, Steve and Ann, uh, let us first thank you for your dedication. You're so very welcome. Okay, um, I and my husband have heard you say many times that there is no soul buried in the ground. In the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, the quote, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, uh, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting content. What, what, what did uh, God say to the serpent? On your belly in the dust all the days of your life you will crawl. It's a statement of degradation. Those that did not overcome, those that did not participate in the um, first resurrection, they've still got mortal souls. Though they may have, though they may have a, a um, eternal body, which is to say, a spiritual body, it's not eternal because it's going to perish also if, if they are not careful. But um, they still have a mortal soul, which means they're sinners. They're dead. This is why it's written in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, those that are dead, meaning mortal, liable to die, must remain that way 
for a thousand years until the second resurrection. They will either take part in that second resurrection or they're going into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Okay, and I hope that helps you with that. Randy from Maryland. I thought that the Canaanites are the offspring of Ham, Genesis 10, 6, and not from Cain, or did I miss something? You certainly missed something. Canaanites spelled C-A-N-N, -N, and uh, they are the children of Ham. But Kenites are K-E-N-I-T-E-S, not Canaanites, Ham's offspring, Kenites. The very word itself in the Hebrew tongue means the sons of Cain. You will find one of the first places, 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55, they were already keeping books for Judah. Okay, K-E-N-I-T-E-S. You will find them all through God's word as God uh, speaks of them. You will even find Christ talking about them in Matthew chapter 13, beginning with verse 35, when he said, they're the children that Satan planted, the devil planted, uh, here on earth in, in the field, which is the world. Julie from Illinois. I have a question about Ezekiel 44, 25. Will we be able to talk with and witness to only our family who never ever heard the gospel or will family who did hear it but did not believe or were taught incorrectly? Um, those above, those that, you know, many people refuse what they hear because why, it's not true. And they didn't have a prayer of a chance to hear truth because it wasn't taught in their church. And that, and that is a sin. And it is a great sin. But God has a way. So it, it is both sides. It simply means those that didn't make it for whatever reason. Um, and uh, there you have it. You can talk to them and work with them. Uh, Willie from Illinois. Should we wash each other's feet? Um, explain John chapter 13. Well, why did Christ wash the disciples' feet? You have to know and understand the deeper spiritual meaning. In other words, when at that time there were dirt paths and people wore sandals. Your feet got, they were filthy. But the meaning being, and the reason Christ did it, is when you pass through this earth age, there's only one entity that can cleanse you. There's only one entity that can wash the dirt from you, spiritually speaking. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, it, you can wash your friend's feet if you want to, but it has nothing to do with what Christ was teaching. He was teaching that when you're in this earth, even a disciple, you're gonna get dirty. You're, you're going to have sin, minor sin, and Christ is the one that washes it away. So he's the one you better talk to, and he's the one you better repent to and ask forgiveness. Yeah, he's the one that issues it. That's what it was all about. Uh, uh, Shirley from North Dakota. Is Daniel in heaven? Is there an explanation? I heard he was not in heaven but I thought everyone went to heaven when they died. I, I know how, why you would say this, and I know how that maybe somebody that was unlearned in the Word of God might come to that conclusion. In Acts chapter 2, it speaks of the fact in Peter teaching the church that Christ was transfigured, but even David's flesh body remained on earth where Christ did not. Christ descended to heaven. But don't ever worry, um, uh, Daniel, Daniel's, um, which, which David was the one mentioned there, but Daniel also, the, his, his spirit went to the Father as well as David's went to the Father. This is where this teaching comes from. It simply means that Christ was transfigured where his body was changed also, just as Elijah's was, whereby he overcame death. He defeated death. 
not just for himself, but for all of us. And so it is, because God is the God of the living, not the dead. Uh, Ronnie from Arkansas, why does God allow suffering like starving children in third world nations? Well, because people won't read his word. You know, God's word is one of the greatest agriculture books that there is, telling you how to provide crops, how to, to rotate even crops. Much of that crop rotation is done to this day. It's taught in the Bible. Uh, and how to plant what by what and so on and so forth. But not going by God's word. It isn't God. God tells them. If God tells you this is how you overcome and you don't do it, then that's your fault. Okay. So it is not that God allows it. He allows you to go all the way to hell if that's where you want to go. And unfortunately, this is why that we have helped teach people. In other words, you can give a man a fish and he can eat that fish and he'll be hungry again tomorrow. But you can teach him how to fish and he'll never hunger again. So that's how it goes. That's what God's Word is about. It's teaching people how to overcome, how not to suffer. Uh, uh, Pat from Oklahoma, and you're so welcome. We enjoy teaching. I have a question regarding the Gulf, okay? In Luke 16, is Luke 16 the only place in the Bible that speaks of the Gulf? You have told us that there are usually two witnesses or places to find information on the same subject. Would you please tell me where else in the Bible it speaks of the Gulf? I can't find it. Well, um, you have to realize the word gulf is a translation by Luke, who was a medical doctor, and it means a wound, okay? Uh, an open gash, wound. And um, so naturally, you're not, unless it was a medical doctor, you probably wouldn't find that terminology again anywhere in the word, but you will find that people are in paradise with God. You can You can find that in even Christ's teachings when in John, St. John chapter 8, where he was telling the Kenites, you're of your father the devil, and the de his deeds you'll always do unless they convert. And then some of those that were with him um, mentioned Abraham. And then he stated, God is not the God of the dead, but God of the living. In other words, he had seen Abraham. Why? Because Abraham wasn't dead. And uh, there you have it, paradise, where they are with the Father. Um, Mer Merenike from Indiana. Uh, Pastor Murray, please explain Ezekiel 28.18 and Revelation 20.10. Thank you. Ezekiel 28.18 has to do with Satan as the king of Tyrus, which means the false rock when he was the, had elevated himself, earned it, the, the position of protecting cherub, that after having earned that, he began to take pride in himself because God said, I made you the full pattern, you're beautiful. And he began to take this pride in himself. And um, in doing so, he will be turned to ashes from within. Now, in Revelation 20.10, you're at the end of the millennium, and there is a lake of fire, and Satan's going to be cast into it. That's where he's turned to ashes from within. So the two are connected. It's called, if you go ahead and read the last verse or two of that 20th chapter, it's the second death. Well, well then what is the second death? It's the death of the soul, the very being, the entity. It's erased, it's blotted out, doesn't exist any longer. Marty from Tennessee. What does the Bible say about when someone experiences repeated attacks from the enemy, especially when you reach levels of success and happiness? Well, well Satan always, he, he always likes to plow the rug right out from under you. That's why you have to be on guard. If you're one of God's elect, 
he knows who will come against him and who will stand against him. But you don't have to put up with it. That's why in Luke 12, um, verse, I'm sorry, Luke uh, 19 and verses um, 8, Luke 10, verses 18 and 19, Christ gives you power over all your enemies. You got nothing to worry about. And our Heavenly Father loves His children. And He, he tells you there, I, I beheld Satan fall as a star from heaven, but I give you power over all your enemies. That means Him too. So when He comes against you, declare the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and order anything negative away from you and bring Christ on in. That's where your success comes from is following Him. Brandon from California, before having that before having that close relationship and knowledge about God, how do you have that spiritual discernment to know who is teaching right from wrong? Well, that's real simple. When, when they're teaching God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and it makes sense, there's clarity there, and you hear the simplicity in which God teaches, then you're teaching right. You study for yourself. Don't let some other person ever do your thinking for you. You do your own thinking and always make sure that uh, it aligns with God's Word and you'll, you'll do all right. You'll be just fine. That's how you determine whether does it align with God's Word or does it not. If it's traditions of men, avoid it. Uh, Kathy from Tennessee, I was baptized as an infant before the age of accountability. Can my husband baptize me? We do not belong to a church here where we live. Any Christian can baptize another Christian. And a person, baptism is a personal thing between a person that knows what they're doing, that they are they're saying, I do believe that Christ went into the tomb, that he resurrected into eternal life, and that we have eternal life through him. But what, what, what you do is you simply have your husband anoint you with the oil of our people, olive oil, and then baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Many people will say, well, it's, you just have to be Jesus only. No, then you show your ignorance because Jesus means what? It's Yeshua, Yahweh's Savior. So you have the Father and the Son. And where they're present is the Holy Spirit. Same thing. So go ahead and say all three and then baptize you and uh, you're, you're baptized. But a church might not accept that baptism, but Christ will, okay? That's what's important. Bonnie from California. Where in the Bible does it say that the Antichrist will look like Jesus? Well, I think probably you heard me say the Antichrist looks like many people picture Christ as looking. He's a beautiful creature. Okay. You, you, can, you can read it in the, the question was asked earlier about Ezekiel chapter 28. You can read prior to that 18th verse backing up to about 13 or 14, where it's Christ said, I made you the full pattern, which means you lack nothing. You were beautiful. And, and so Satan was and, and is. And, uh, very, and this is why many people are taken with him. But Christ also lacked nothing. A lot of people say, well, he was calmly. No, he was, that word means awesome. He lacked nothing as far as beauty is concerned. And uh, so, uh, but so it is. But the thing is, you know the key of David unlocks the lock. The key of David with David's offspring, you've got the true Christ, not the fake. Harold from Illinois, what are the four hidden dynasties? The four hidden dynasties you find in Zechariah chapter one is the four horns that are our enemy. That is to say, let me I correct myself, they are the horns or the power that the enemy uses against us. And those four dynasties always have been and always will be, number one, political, number two, financial, number three, educational, and last but not least, religion. 
those are, uh, Satan loves to use a religion. He loves to get in a pulpit and mislead people. That's why Christ would say in Mark 13, don't let anyone come in my name deceiving you, meaning claiming to be a Christian preacher or claiming to be Christ because he hadn't arrived yet, not till the seventh trump, the truth that is. Jerry from Florida. What does the number 40 mean in the Bible? I know that it is used numerous times. Probation. 40 means probation. And uh, usually um, um, it is a probation period or a time. Um, 